Okay, so welcome back. Thanks for being here. This is our evening session. So we have first Professor Greco and then uh, Duncan Precious, so epistemology night. So Professor Greco holds uh, Robert McDavid and uh, Catherine McDavid chair in philosophy at Georgetown University. His publications include The Transmission of Knowledge, Achieving Knowledge, a Virtue Theoretic Account of Epistemic Normativity, and Putting Skeptics in Their Place, The Nature of Skeptical Arguments and the Role in Philosophical Inquiry. He was the editor of American Philosophical Quarterly from 2013 through 2020. So, thanks, uh, Professor Greco, for being here. Please. Okay, well, thank you uh, for organizing the conference and, and for having, having me. I'm very happy to be here to be able uh, to talk to you all. So I will share my screen now. And uh, I, uh, <clears throat> uh, the title of my talk is uh, Social Epistemic Dependence and an Agenda for Social uh, Religious Epistemology. And I have a little outline just to sort of show you what's coming. So in part one, I want to just offer some thoughts regarding contemporary social epistemology and its relation to religious epistemology. Uh, and in particular, uh, a central theme in social epistemology is that there are important and underappreciated phenomena involving social epistemic dependence or epistemic dependence on other persons uh, and or on features of the broader social environment. So epistemologies that are inconsistent with this kind of dependence are often labeled individualist, and epistemologies that accommodate it are labeled anti-individualist. Uh, and a rough characterization of the question here is, is this. Um, are epistemic properties or standings or status entirely a function of the individual's onboard cognitive resources, so to speak? Uh, so, for example, what evidence this, the uh, individual has or, or, or what cognitive capacities or intellectual virtues the uh, subject has, or alternatively, can they be partly a function of relations to other persons and or the social environment? And so many of the disputes between individualists and anti-individualists, perhaps all of them, show up in religious epistemology as well. Um, and uh, that's no surprise given that religious um, traditions, especially the, the uh, is, is, uh, Abrahamic traditions, uh, are uh, you know social uh, traditions that put a uh, an emphasis on uh, the epistemic community, uh, relationships to other persons, um, uh, epistemic authority, uh, things like this, which are front uh, and center in the issues between uh, uh, individualists and anti-individualists and social epistemology more generally. So. That leads us to the question, how are we to understand social epistemic dependence, right? If the, if the issues are between, uh, you know, whether a certain kind of social epistemic dependence exists and needs to be recognized or whether we should uh, uh, not accommodate that kind of social epistemic dependence, then we need a good understanding of what social epistemic dependence is. And, and so we're not doing ordinary language here. Uh, we're asking how can we best understand the notion of social epistemic dependence so as to illuminate relevant issues. Uh, and that is both issues both in social epistemology and religious epistemology. So once we have that in place, I'm gonna argue for a, different, for a certain characterization of social epistemic dependence. Uh, then we're in place for part three, uh, where I'm going to argue that you can use this conception to frame a kind of agenda for religious epistemology. So in effect, religious epistemology through the lens of social epistemic dependence properly conceived. Okay, so that's the talk. Um, so part one, contemporary social epistemology. So often social epistemology is, is characterized in terms of a list of relevant topics and disputes. So for example, the nature of testimonial justification and knowledge. Uh, the nature and role of intellectual authority, uh, the significance of epistemic communities, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, but I think social epistemology can also be uh, characterized in a more principled way, uh, namely as the investigation of various phenomena of social epistemic dependence or epistemic dependence on other persons or on the, so on the social environment. And again, views which fail to accommodate important phenomena of social epistemic dependence are often labeled in the field as, as individualist. And here the target is often Enlightenment authors, such as Descartes or Hume, Locke or Kant, uh, who, who are sort of the, you know, the champions of individualism. Uh, 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 but also contemporary views in epistemology, such as reductionism, about the testimonial justification about testimonial justification and knowledge. So, for example, in the epistemology of testimony, you know, the, 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 the reductionist about testimony says, look, there's nothing special about testimonial justification or testimonial knowledge. It's just more, let's say, uh, inductive knowledge. So it's just a matter of what resources uh, now understood in terms of evidential resources, the individual has in order to judge the reliability of a testifier or the truth of a certain piece of testimony based on, you know, evidence about track record or whatever it might be. But the, the whole point is that it's entirely a function of the onboard resources of the individual to sort of evaluate the testifier and the testimony. Anti-reductionists uh, would deny that, saying that, uh, look, uh, testimony, uh, testimonial knowledge and justification can be a function of more than just what evidence the individual has. So, for example, trust theories in epistemology uh, would uh, say that um, justification and knowledge here might depend on an interpersonal relationship between the speaker and the hearer, and then of course it's on, it's up to the trust theory to, to you know, explain how that could be, how the interpersonal relation could have epistemic significance. But the point here is that the the reductionist, as I've just described, reductionism is an individualist theory. It makes it makes testimonial justification all about the resources of the individual, whereas the trust theory, uh, especially ones that emphasize the importance of an interpersonal relation, uh, they're anti-individualist because they're making testimonial justification and knowledge not simply a function of what's going on uh, with the individual. Okay. So now in other work, I've argued uh, that social epistemology is relevant for religious epistemology. And that's a pretty easy argument to make considering the list of topics above, right? all of the topics, whether they be the importance of testimony or authority or epistemic community, they're all, of course, relevant for the way uh, we, uh, way people formulate um, uh, their religious beliefs uh, and then presumably relevant for the evaluation, the epistemic evaluation, epistemic standing of those religious beliefs. Again, especially in uh, the Abrahamic faiths, which place such importance on uh, community and interpersonal relations, etc. So today I want to go beyond making that pretty easy argument that social epistemology is relevant to religious epistemology. And I want to argue for an agenda, an agenda for social religious epistemology framed in terms of a particular conception of social epistemic dependence. And to anticipate uh, social epi epistemic dependence, I want to argue, is best conceived as a kind of vulnerable, de vulnerable dependence for one's epistemic properties on the epistemic properties of other persons and other relevant features of the social environment. So again, uh, I'm going to conceive epistemic dependence as a kind of vulnerable dependence for one's own epistemic properties on the epistemic properties of others. Now, framing social, religious, framing social religious epistemology in this way, I claim has three theoretical payoffs. Uh, first, it deepens our understanding, I claim, 
of various disputes in the field. What's at stake in various disputes uh, in religious epistemology? Uh, it also helps us to better understand the relevant social epistemic phenomena. So I think that 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 this this conception of social epistemic dependence that I'm going to frame gives us insight into the nature of the phenomena that we're disputing about. Uh, and then finally, I think um, uh, there's an anti-skeptical value, right? Uh, by acknowledging forms of social epistemic dependence, as I characterize it, uh, we get resources for defending an anti-skeptical view of religious belief. It becomes easier to see how religious belief could be justified, and if true, even amount uh, to knowledge. Now, today I'm going to focus on our, on on uh, claim A, that a certain way of conceiving social epistemic dependence deepens our understanding of various disputes in the field. Uh, there's just no time to argue for B. In effect, that would be to argue that the anti-individualist is right on various issues in the dispute with the individualist over whether we should recognize the existence of uh, social epistemic dependence so conceives. Uh, so there's no time to argue for B, and there's no need to argue for C. So the idea is if we can use these resources to re reject enlightenment ideals that you know religious people are always getting hit over the head with, uh, then it's going to be easier to um, conceive of, of religious belief as epistemically uh, uh, re respectable uh, and reasonable and justified uh, if we replace these epistemic ideals with a more social ideal of how to, you know, how the epistemology works here. And in effect, it puts us in a position to make same boat arguments that, look, you can't hold religious, religious beliefs up to this, uh, these individualist standards if, in fact, social epistemic dependence is pervasive outside of the religious realm. So in other words, the idea is that, in general, there are these phenomena of social epistemic dependence that we have to recognize in order to properly understand how our beliefs have positive epistemic status. And so this is just putting religious belief in the same, you know, uh, epistemic boat, uh, so to speak, as other beliefs. There's no need to argue for that. It's going to be obvious if the other stuff uh, I'm saying is correct. Okay. All right. So part two, uh, what is social epistemic dependence? Or better, how should social epistemology and social religious epistemology characterize social epistemic dependence? And again, this is not an ordinary language question. It's more a question in conceptual engineering. It's, you know, what, what, what characterization of the concept will be theoretically useful given the problem space of social epistemology in general and religious epistemology in particular? So the I suggest that I suggest that uh, the, the the following criteria for an adequate characterization that is adequate to the theoretical concerns of the field. So I want to say that such a characterization should uh, illuminate or deepen our understanding of first social epistemology's critique of enlightenment ideals, enlightenment ideals of independence and self sufficiency and invulnerability. And also enlightenment notions of intellectual autonomy, what intellectual autonomy consists in. So, in effect, the idea is that the individualist embodied enlightenment ideals, the individualism embodied enlightenment ideals, uh, doesn't properly recognize phenomena of social epistemic dependence. So our characterization of that concept should you know, deepen our understanding of that critique, okay? And in similar fashion, it should deepen our understanding of social epistemology's critique of traditional epistemology as over-individualistic, where traditional means not just enlightenment, but like prior to 1980 or something like that, where 
and, and going forward, right? Um, traditional epistemologists uh, still live among us, embracing individualist ideals. And one prominent uh, theme in social epistemology is that this is incorrect, and and that you know th there has to be a uh, uh, a shift here in our understanding of um, uh, the epistemology. Okay, so another thing that our characterization should do is it should illuminate, it should illuminate disputes between individuals and anti-individualists, both in general and on particular issues. So, for example, you know, the, the nature of testimonial justification or the role of intellectual authority or the role of uh, social location in the... Uh, in, in uh, determining or partly determining a person's epistemic status, right? So uh, it should illuminate those uh, disputes. And then finally, it should illuminate various social epistemology themes. So for example, you find in social epistemology an important idea of the division of epistemic labor, a related idea of the distribution of cognitive burdens. Uh, between the individual and the social environment. Um, the importance of healthy epistemic communities, the epistemic significance of social location. These are all important social epistemological themes that our characterization of social epistemic dependent, dependence, again, should illuminate, should, should, uh, should promote a deeper, a deeper understanding of these themes. Okay, well, now we get to the characterization. So there's gonna be two big ideas here that go into what I think of as an adequate characterization of the phenomenon, okay? Or the phenomenon, I should say, because there are varieties of epistemic dependence. So the first is that epistemic dependence involves a supervenience relation. And in particular, epistemically dependent properties supervene not merely on facts about the individual, but on facts about other persons in the broader social environment. So this is an idea that I take from Sandy Goldberg and also from Duncan Pritchard, who I think is sitting here listening. And uh, what, what this idea does is it, 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 captures, it captures the idea that one, the dependence is metaphysical, not merely causal, right? So the problem with understanding epistemic dependence as merely causal is that it's trivial that our epistemic properties causally depend on the epistemic properties of others and on other features of the social environment. So, for example, I depend on others for my education, for my training, and then that goes into my capacities to know the world. Well, the arch individualists can accept that, right? Locke or, or Kant are not going to have a problem with acknowledging that kind of causal dependence on, say, one's education or one's training, or for that matter, on a person to give you the testimony, right? So it's not merely causal dependence. What Pritchard and Goldberg are arguing is that it's more of a metaphysical dependence that the idea is that the individual's epistemic properties supervene not just on what's going on within the skin, so to speak, or um, uh, uh, within the agent, uh, as, as Pritchard would have it, but, but really supervene on a broader base than that to include the epistemic properties of other persons and the social environment. So this, this also, so this idea uh, also captures, besides the distinction between a metaphysical dependence and a, and a merely causal dependence, it also captures the idea that the epistemic burdens can be distributed across the individual and other persons. And that, that's captured by this idea of a broader supervenience space for the epistemic properties okay, of the individual. Okay, so that's one big idea. The second big idea is that epistemic dependence is vulnerable, de vulnerable dependence. 
it carries no guarantees that the thing relied upon is reliable or that the thing depended on is dependable. So I believe that you have to add this, this idea of vulnerable dependence to capture the idea that epistemic dependence is real or robust, robust dependence. Uh, and to, to explain that, um, you know, we, we can invoke a distinction between merely relying on others, merely relying on others in some way, and relying on others in a way that involves vulnerability that they might actually fail you, right? So even individuals allow for reliance on what the individual can guarantee to be reliable, right? So for example, the reductionist about testimonial knowledge, right? The, test, the reductionist about testimonial knowledge will rely on the other person for testimony, but only insofar as he evaluates that person as a reliable informer, or he'll rely, he, he will uh, uh, rely on a piece of testimony, but in so, only insofar as that piece, to te piece of testimony passes his own uh, evaluation. Uh, and, and so he's, he's, he's relying on something that from his own perspective is guaranteed to be reliable. Okay. So our notion of vulnerable de dependence is going to distinguish the kind of dependence that even an individualist could accept and the kind of dependence that an anti-individualist wants to insist upon. Okay. So this suggests the following characterization uh, of social epistemic dependence. Uh, so first we could say a subject epistemically depends on a social environment E, and we include persons in the social environment. So it could be a dependent on, it could be a dependence on other persons or other features of the social environment, such as its structure or the norms that are in play or something like that. But a subject epistemically depends on a social environment E for epistemic property P, just in case one, P partially supervenes on some epistemic property R of E, and two, P does not partially supervene on S's knowledge or epistemic justification that E has R. And then we can use the same sort of formulation to distinguish individualist and anti-individualist views. So an epistemology that allows for social epistemic dependence, that counts as anti-individualist, uh, that's an epistemology uh, that um, allows us that for some epistemic properties P, not all, but for some epistemic property P of some subject in some social environment, P partially supervenes on epistemic properties R of E, and two, P does not partially supervene on S's knowledge or epistemic property uh, or justification. Uh, uh, does not supervene on S's knowledge or epistemic justification that E has R. Okay. So condition one of the formulations is meant to capture the Goldberg-Pritchard idea, the insight that social epistemic property, uh, I'm sorry, that social epistemic dependence is best understood as a distributed supervenience relation. In effect, an epistemic property manifests social dependence insofar as it supervenes on the epistemic properties of other persons, but also you know, other persons or, or the social environment. And then condition, condition two adds what uh, I think is missing from the Goldberg and Pritchard formulation, and that is the idea that social uh, epistemic dependence uh, properly understood as vulnerable dependence. So it doesn't come with knowledge of reliability or a guarantee of reliability. Okay. And here, finally, I just want to note that this allows for Goldberg's distinction between direct and diffuse dependence. So on, in Goldberg's terminology, and, and um, uh, I think Pritchard accepts this as well, you can talk about direct epistemic dependence on another person for their epistemic properties, and that would be most salient in the case of testimony or in the case of authority, where if you're buying into this kind of view, your epistemic standing depends in part on the epistemic standing of the testifier or of the authority. 
and so the dependence is on the epistemic properties of another person directly. But then Goldberg wants to insist, and, and certainly you see this in Pritchard as well, that that's not the only kind of epistemic dependence that we care about. There's also diffuse epistemic dependence, and that means dependence on broader features of the social environment. Uh, and that could come in various forms, but one easy way to see it is in this phenomenon of, of monitoring, right? Suppose you have a social environment, an epistemic community, where everybody's kind of just minding their own business. And so if someone lies to you, you're kind of left to your own devices. Or if somebody's incompetent, but you know, spouting off their opinions, uh, you're sort of left to your own devices to figure out you know, that this person is either insincere or incompetent. Think of a different kind of epidemic community which monitors each other for competence and sincerity. So that if someone is uh, spouting baloney to me, um, uh, someone else is likely to step in and say, no, that's wrong, or that's not right. So in this case, it, you know, I would be depending not just on the person in front of me testifying, but on other people around me and maybe the norms in place in the broader social environment that say, hey, if you hear somebody saying something wrong, step in and say so and, uh, you know, act as that kind of uh, 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 epistemic monitoring. An example of this monitoring happened to me happened to me in Brazil when somebody was explaining to me why they, why a certain bar was lined lined with jars of looked like jars of some kind of fruit or vegetable and somebody was explaining to me well that's how you that's how you make oh the Brazilian liquor. I can't remember what it's named. What's the Brazilian liquor called? Somebody give it to me. Cachaça. Just, what is it? Cachaça. Cachaça. That's how cachaça is made. And then somebody else has stepped in no and said, no, those are pickles. So <laughs> so I you know, I would have believed that it was cachaça. This is how cachaça was made. And this person, I think you know, thought that he was telling me the truth, but then some of his friends stepped in and said, no, 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 that's not right. That would be an example of epistemic monitoring where my, you know, I, my epistemic standing ends up depending not just on the person who's testifying, but other people in the social environment. Okay. So, uh, back to our criteria for an adequate characterization. Um, so we said that an adequate characterization one that's adequate to the theoretical concerns of social epistemology and religious epistemology in particular should illuminate or deepen our understanding of, you know, various disputes, various issues, various themes. And I'm just going to argue without going through these themes, I'm going to argue that this, um, this conception, uh, or I'm going to claim anyway, that this conception does a good job here. Um, I mean, you know, in particular, for example, it it gives us a way of precisifying the idea, the individualist idea, that epistemic status is entirely a function of the individual's onboard cognitive resources. The distributed supervenience thesis says is 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 a, is a denial of that claim and saying that of the individual's epistemic status can be a function of more than just what's going on in terms of the individual's resources and can be a function partly on the relationship of the individual to other persons in the social environment. Okay. And I think that that same characterization illuminates various disputes between individualists and anti-individualists, for example, about the role of authority in uh, one's epistemic uh, life. Okay, but here I want to concentrate on this I this this theme 
of an epistemic division of labor and a related theme of a distribution of cognitive burdens. So social epistemology talks a lot about the division of epistemic labor, but at least in one sense of that term, an individualist should be happy with an epistemic division of labor. So for example, suppose we have a multifaceted cognitive task and we decide to divvy up the task. You go solve one part of the problem, I'll go solve another part of the problem, and then we come back together and we'll put our, we'll put our uh, results on the table, but I'm not gonna trust you unless I can guarantee that you did your part correctly. Maybe by checking on your work, maybe on checking on your credentials, or what other, whatever. But I'm not gonna divide my labor with you outside the context of a guarantee that you're reliable, that you're dependable. So that's, that's a division of epistemic labor that even an individualist could love. So a different idea possibly is the idea of a distribution of cognitive burden. So I guess you could read that in just the same way that you know you could a, distrib a distribution of cognitive burden could just be a division of epistemic labor. But you could also read that more in terms of the supervenience thesis. A distribution of cognitive burden really is uh, uh, a distribution of you know the different responsibilities for whether an epistemic standing uh, uh, is, 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 is possessed or not by, by the individual. So there's that supervenience thesis that comes in, um, distributed supervenience. But even that is not as strong as the idea of reducing cognitive burden, okay? And I think it's, it's this idea of reducing cognitive burden, which is crucial uh, in this social epistemology uh, uh, theme, or at least in the anti-individualist uh, uh, version. So, um, no, notice that the distribution of burden among other persons is consistent with the redistribution of burdens within the individual. So, it's consistent with reductionism. I'm, I'm just trading knowledge for knowledge. I'm trading knowledge that P for knowledge that you're reliable with respect to P, or I'm trading knowledge that P for knowledge that you know that P. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not reducing my burden. What we want is a conception of epistemic dependence that not only dis redistributes what burdens I have, but reduces it, uh, reduces those burdens. So robust social epistemic dependence involves a reducing of cognitive burden and offloading of cognitive burden from the individual and onto the social environment. And I think the present characterization captures that stronger idea. Okay, so that's, that's uh, part two, the, the, the characterization of social epistemic dependence that I want to defend. And, and now part three, an agenda for social uh, religious epistemology. So, um, I, I think I can go through this fairly quickly because, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is going to be kind of obvious given what has gone before. So regarding uh, testimony and the transmission of knowledge, but now we're talking about religious testimony and the transmission of religious knowledge. Clearly, we want an anti-reductionist view here because it's only the anti-reductionist view is, that's going to be anti-individualist. But... What I want to say is that we also we also want diffuse dependence as well as direct dependence. So it's not just that we want to be able to rely on other persons for their testimony. We want to rely on broader features of the social environment, broader features of the epistemic community that will also contribute to whether testimonial justification of knowledge is received from the various kinds of speakers that you would have in a religious context, whether those be prophets or scripture or just individuals testifying about their own experience, or even you could think of revelation as testimony from God. Uh, you want a broader, you want, you want broader features of the epistemic community to facilitate that kind of transmission of knowledge from the speaker to the hearer. And we can also 
talk about the role of epistemic communities in transmitting knowledge just more broadly. So we can talk about in institutional structures. We can talk about various norms, social norms that are in place in epistemic communities that can either enable or undermine the transmission of knowledge more broadly. Uh, and I'm sure that all of you are more than capable of imagining examples of institutional structures or examples of social norms which would have either an enabling effect or an undermining effect of the capacity for a religious community to transmit knowledge either from one member to another or from one generation to another. And then similar points can be made about the place of intellectual authority, right? We want an anti-reductionist view here. We want to acknowledge the importance of diffuse dependence as well as direct, the role of epistemic communities in allowing for competent and epistemically effective intellectual authority. And again, you know, we're looking more for more than a division of labor here. We're looking for an offloading of cognitive burden. So when we think about what a religious authority should do, a religious authority shouldn't simply just help us divide up the expertise in the community. It should do so in a way that offloads a cognitive burden so that the non-experts, the non-authorities can more easily benefit from um, uh, uh, the authorities uh, uh, that have that role in the community. And I think that this speaks to a different notion of autonomy, very different from the Enlightenment notion of autonomy. So think of autonomy as speaking to what qualifies as um, quality agency. You know, what kind of agency do you want? Whereas the Enlightenment conception of autonomy stresses independence and self-sufficiency, a more social view of autonomy stresses power, right? The better your community is structured, the better your relationships to other individuals in the community are structured so as to empower you intellectually, then that will increase your own agency in that sense. So that's agency as power benefiting from empowerment versus agency that is just all about independence and self-sufficiency. And notice there's going to be plenty of cases where there's a, where there's a trade-off between independence and power. So, um, you know, what do you want? Do you want to be able to do a lot of things or do you want to be able to do them yourself? Uh, which do you value more? Okay, and finally, I'll take a few minutes to talk about the epistemic significance of faith and revelation. So, you know, as we all know, there are many traditions, uh, including themes, you know, parts of the Christian tradition which oppose faith to knowledge or more broadly oppose faith to reason. But from a social epistemic point of view, faith could be understood as a mode of knowledge uh, and providing a kind of reason, a kind of intellectual reason, not just a kind of pragmatic reason. Okay. So I think this is very much related to two conceptions of trust. And of course, the notion of faith and the notion of trust are intimate related, intimately related. So here are two conceptions of trust that are out there are, again, mere reliance versus vulnerable dependence. So, you know, some of you might uh, remember Ronald Reagan's famous claim during the Cold War that in, in, negotiate, in negotiations with the Russians, he was going to trust but verify. Well, that's a kind of an odd notion of trust there. I guess it's one that's out there where to trust someone is completely consistent with verifying that they're trustworthy. And in fact, not trusting them before you verify or guarantee that they're trustworthy. But that's not trust as vulnerable dependence. And I think that, again, the notion of vulnerable dependence is uh, probably the one that we want here. 
Another distinction is between trust as a disposition, which resides in the individual, and trust as a relation between the person who's trusting and the person who's trusted. Um, so we have a phrase in English that a person has a lot of trust. And I think that speaks to the, the notion of trust as a disposition that resides in the individual. But we also say there's a lot of trust between those, pe those two people. And that speaks to trust as a relation. Now, maybe these are just two sides of the same coin, because maybe you know, trust as a disposition is a disposition to enter into trust as a relation. And so it's two sides of the same coin. But what's important here is that uh, uh, whether you're emphasizing one side or the other, we're talking about trust as vulnerable dependence here, not trust as verified dependence or guaranteed dependence. So now, should we think of trust as a virtue in the hearer or in the speaker or as something that's distributed between the speaker or the hearer? So maybe in a proper trusting relationship, there must be proper virtues in the hearer and proper virtues in the speaker. And we could say, um, uh, we could somehow, you know, talk about the combination of virtues in both. But I, I think the distributed idea is different. And I think a nice way to model it is with the notion of joint agency. So um, in a recent book, The Transmission of Knowledge, I argued for a joint agency model of testimony and the transmission of knowledge. And I think that a similar model works for uh, faith and revelation, where the idea is that, um, I'm just going to go through this quickly, but the idea is that uh, the trust relationship or the faith relationship should be understood in the model of, of joint agency, where you know one aspect of joint agency is that the people involved in that, that joint agency have a joint intention. They're committed to doing something together. And then another aspect of joint agency is that they understand each other's intentions. So it's not just that we both want to do something together, but we both understand that we want to do something together, right? And then there's the question of, do we do that together well? And we can do that well or not well. We can achieve our joint intention uh, in a virtuous way or in a way that falls short of virtue. But one way to understand virtue here is that it's virtuous joint agency. It's not just a virtuous contribution by me and a virtuous contribution by you, but it's a virtuous joint agency. And that allows, that, that distributed notion of virtue allows that different contributions might be appropriate for different instances of the joint agency. So maybe there might be cases where we're doing something together and my part in that doesn't require much at all. Whereas there might be other instances of doing something together where, you know, we, we both have significant burdens in order to pull it off well, right? So in the former case, think of when you're trying to teach a child to catch a ball, a small child to catch a ball. So there's a joint agency there. What you're trying to do together is play catch, but you're doing almost all the work because the kid doesn't know what they're doing, right? So you have to place that ball just right. That kid is trying, so they're doing their part in that sense, but you know they're not doing their part well. But if you look at if you look at the joint agency altogether, the way we're working together, maybe it comes off very well. Maybe the 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 uh, we we very successfully play catch, um, uh, even though one of us has taken on more of the burden for achieving that joint project. Okay. So I think more. So I think that's a nice model of faith and revelation, or might be, um, you know, possibly applied uh, to that as well, where um, uh, you know the the, the the various role by the person receiving uh, and the person uh, giving uh, might be very different, but they do understand that they're doing something together. Uh, and they're doing that together, does require um, participation from both. 
Okay, so um, again, I think this joint agency model nicely illuminates this idea of a distribution of cognitive burden and also offloading uh, cognitive burden uh, uh, to others and or the social environment. Uh, okay, so should religious epistemologists be anti-individualists? Uh, I want to say yes, but I haven't argued for that. What I've argued for is a conception of social epistemic dependence, which should frame various issues. And then we can dispute about whether we should be anti-individualist on these issues or whether we should stick uh, to our individualism. Individualism dies hard uh, and it dies hard in epistemology as well as it does in the practical realm. Okay, I think I had more, but I think I should end there. So I'll just say, uh, obrigado. Thanks a lot, John. Amazing talk. Okay, uh, we have room for questions now. Who, any question? Okay, we have a question for Felipe Medeiros. Hi, John. Great to see you. Uh, Hello, uh, so, I'm wondering, uh, I'm wondering what, where do you think the line is drawn in the in, in the debate in the epistemology of authority between uh, individualists and anti-individualists? Uh, so, so as I understand the debate, m most of what the people who work on that are, are worried about are, uh, are stuff like preemptive reasons and total evidence view and whatever that they are talking about in that debate, right? And the other thing is autonomy versus authority. Those two don't mesh together in like the most obvious ways. Uh, and it seemed to me like you wanted to say it seems like from the stuff that you wanted to say it just seemed like you just want you just wanted to go a full preemptive view like I, I'm authorized to believe in an expert for whatever they say I'm authorized to be dependent on them. <clears throat> but that doesn't seem like you're compatible with the rest of the stuff that you want to say with regard to testimony, right? So is there a tension there or is there something else going on that I'm not seeing? So. I, I'm not sure. Let me let me take the first shot at it, but you might have to come back at me with another, you know, with a reformulation. So, so one thing I don't one one thing that I I, I think the anti-individualist is not committed to is that there are no epistemic burdens on the believer, and that would be including in the case where the believer benefits from intellectual authority, okay? So really anti-individualism is just the denial of individualism here, right? So where the individualist wants to say, look, ultimately your epistemic standing is a function of your cognitive resources. And so insofar as you take advantage of intellectual authority, you have to do so in a way in which that reliance on authority is epistemically respectable from your own point of view, that you've somehow convinced yourself that the authority knows better than you do. So maybe that's, you know, maybe you have good evidence that the authority knows better than you do. And so your evidence guarantees the reliability or the dependability of the authority. The anti-individualist anti wants to deny that picture. In order to deny that picture, you don't have to argue that reliance on authority has nothing to do with your epistemic resources, or that you have no obligations or responsibilities in the way you interact with intellectual authority. Maybe you do, but, the, but, but what you're relying is that in the end, uh, there is this kind of vulnerable dependence which falls short of knowing that the authority is not going to fail you or knowing that the authority is reliable in which 
in 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 what they're in in the way that they're claiming to be. Does that help? Yeah, yeah I'm just wondering what why that's special to like the anti-individualists. Uh, it seems like anyone is like even the the staunch individualist is ready to give you that. So. I'm just wondering what's what's the well, no. well see I don't think it is right so for one example for one some individuals just rule out reliance on intellectual authority right so so for example a, a lock would you know you have these passages where you know you're just not supposed to, you know intellectual authority in the you know authority in the epistemic realm of the intellectual realm is 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 anathema okay but then there's a more but I would say a contemporary reductionist view where sure you're allowed to you're allowed to rely on authority, but only in so far as you've evaluated the authority as reliable and dependable. I want to I and, and the anti individualist is saying not even that second. Not even that second kind of. Individualism is really going to fly. I, I, I basically recognizing recognizing a phenomenon of a social epistemic dependence on authority where I just don't have the resources to always evaluate the authorities on which I depend, uh, not in a way that the individualist would, would require. Yeah. Right. So so that view sounds a lot like the preemption view, but, but on the preemption view, I'm still responsible for checking whether that person is an authority, right? Uh, and, and that's still that's still enough to do the work that like the individualist wants to ascribe uh, to to you to you as an individual with sufficient autonomy. So that's why I'm not seeing you know what's special about the the social term. I, I see it on every other realm. I just don't see it on this debate how it is different. You see? Okay. All right, I won't. I won't. I don't think I have anything better there, so I'll. We'll just have to. We'll yeah. Have to think about it more. Maybe we can correspond or something. And I. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Great. Thank you. So you have another question from uh, Professor Clark Kelly. Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, John. That was a great paper. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Okay. I have a question about the. Uh, the very end, you make a sweeping comment about um, you use the term religion that you think for religious epistemology, uh, social epistemology uh, is more suited. Um, do, you, do you mean this? I, and you have spoken about Abrahamic um, religions in, in your talk, uh, and they do seem to, to me to require communities and because there are texts that are translated there are communities there are communities of practice they involve rituals and, and the like might there be a more uh, uh, sort of rationalistic religions that don't don't rely on um, this um, the sort of social epist epistemology um, Anyway, I'm just wondering about how broad you take the term religion and um, uh, and the term religious epistemology, or are you really restricting it here to sort of Abrahamic traditions, which seems right to me? Uh, yeah, I I am. I mean, I'm I'm I mean, not necessarily or in principle, but I I just yeah. think Abrahamic traditions are just obviously, you know good grounds for applying social ep epistemic ideas, given yeah. the role of authority, the role of prophecy, the role of revelation, the role of scripture, the role of epistemic communities more generally. But no, I don't think that religious uh, uh, religions would have to be organized that way. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Yeah. But partly, Listen. partly I just sort of wondered, because I wondered like how uh, how much, how far, uh, how successful individualist epistemology really is? That's the, I guess that's sort of what I'm, um, you know, can can we get away from some sort of social epistemology, even in areas where it seems like they're more, where they, it seems more suited to individualistic, rationalistic, 
less traditional. Uh, anyway, I, I, uh, I'm just sort of wondering the extent of social epistemology and even the um, feasibility of uh, enlightenment uh, individualistic epistemology. Just a comment, not a question. Yeah, no, well, no, I think that, you know, I, 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 I don't think it would be good for religious epistemology if it weren't good for epistemology more generally, right? So that same yeah. boat argument, right? Yeah. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't realms. I would, I would think farly, fairly narrow and fairly exceptional realms in which just a completely, into, a, you know, a thorough individualism would have it right. But I think that just as human beings are, for the most part, social beings, you know, human beings are by nature social beings. Yeah. And and it's not just in the practical realm; it's also in the intellectual realm. So we're not always we're not only yeah, are sort of wired to do things together; we're we're wired to think together. And so I think social epistemology is getting out of you know, at at the human epistemic condition, and the religious epistemic condition would be you know, have that in a lot of that uh, uh, built into it. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank That's a lot. So we have another question from Jag. Hey, John, thanks for that talk. Really insightful. Love the way you frame the discussion. I was wondering about the, um, the part where you talked about the difference between cognitive burden and cognitive and offloading and the offloading thing and how you were seeing that as distinguishing the individualist versus the anti-individualist. And I was wondering if you were distinguishing that in terms of the anti the anti-individualist has a particular kind that 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 particular offloading provides a epistemic benefit that the individualist can't adopt. Um, and if so, could the individualist appeal to some kind of offloading, but in terms of some like a, a procedural automaticity. So it's an offloading that happens with within someone's epistemic model of the world. So over a course of time, it even it might even start as some kind of offloading, but then as it becomes more and more habituated, it becomes almost internalized. So they no longer need the outside kind of supervenience relationship anymore. So I, I guess I'm wondering if there's if there's a potential for a scale that the individuals can ultimately refer to as a, a kind of offloading that becomes automatic in their epistemic structure of some kind? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you have in mind. I'm sure, I mean, certainly, certainly there's a phenomenon of me gaining, maybe not me personally, but of someone gaining more and more knowledge. And as they gain more and more knowledge from others, in ways that you know would manifest social epistemic dependence, they become more and more independent. They become more and more self-sufficient, at least in a realm say. In which case, maybe you can throw the ladder away. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe you really need other people to become a Robinson Crusoe. But then you can go off on your island and be a Robinson Crusoe. You know, maybe there are examples of that. Um, but again, I think that would be an exception to the human condition, not typical of the human condition, where we usually are immersed in relationships of social epistemic dependence, either on other persons or on other aspects of the social environment or epistemic community. Is that the sort of thing that you were thinking about? Or I have a feeling you might have been had an entirely different well, phenomenon in mind there. Oh, yeah. no, I, I, well, because I, I'm I'm kind of thinking about this in terms of like the different time scales just organisms have in terms of how they end up like coping with an environment. So mm -hmm. over long evolutionary time scales, we're going to have we're going to build like the, the virtue of adapting to environment. We're going to have internalized constraints that without any kind of social activity, we might be, be able to like, in, inhabit without where well, that may have started off as some kind of socially dependent inhabiting that then over long time scales became something that became more individualized. And so I was kind of wondering if something similar could, could happen in terms of one's one organism's developmental, just like a singular organism's developmental life, where what what started off as a social dependency, like there was like this in, intricate social dependency required, 
but then um, due to a variety of reasons, maybe uh, in terms of their cognitive wit, the cognitive resources available to them, whatever, they, they're able to internalize some kind of procedure, some kind yeah. of epistemic coping that they no, they just no longer needed. Um, yeah. Yeah, that might be so. I, I, that, that might be so. I don't see why it would be in, in principle impossible. But I think of, I, I think of um, epistemology, whether it be social epistemology or religious epistemology, I, I, I think of epistemology as involved in a project of explanation. And what you're trying to explain is how our beliefs have the epistemic standings that they do in the conditions that we're in. So if you radically change those conditions, you might need another epistemology to account for it. Uh, but um, but I think that you know, from my point of view, that's that that's the nature of the problem with individualism. Individualism might be a good theory of some kind of epistemically ideal rational agent or something like that, but it's not a good theory of us. It's not a good. It's not a. It's not explanatory of how beings like us have the epistemic standings that we do in the conditions that we actually find ourselves in. Yeah. So if, if, I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, there's a certain sort of uh, explanatory breadth that social epistemology might have that coheres with how we see ourselves as beings in general that the, individual, the individualist doesn't seem to quite possess. Yeah, I mean that's my assessment, but that's again I didn't argue for that, right? I, yeah, I, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I didn't argue that we should be anti-individualist. I argued that here's a way of thinking of the disputes between individualism and social and, and uh, anti-individualism, and, and and a way of thinking of what's at issue in many of the um, in much of the the problem space of social epistemology, which is also the problem space of religious epistemology, given the social nature of religious belief. Yeah, very well. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks again, John, and uh, thanks for the questions. So.